I think it's also fair to say that as a society, we need to answer a question now. What's the minimum level of acceptable living for any citizen in this country? I'm proud of our country that earlier we answered that question for the elderly. And we said all elderly will have access to care. And we funded and created Medicare. We answered that question for the poor, that poor, the poor will have access to the American health care system. And we created Medicaid. Is it time for us to answer that question now as a society, that no one will live on the streets of America and call it home and figure out what act do we put in place to begin to solve to that problem? It's an honor to work at and be a part of an organization that understands that its mission is bigger than any one individual. Uh, we are proud to be a part of the American healthcare system, a part of America. We're privileged to take care of 12.4, soon to be 13 million members around the country. We have a workforce of over 200,000 professionals, employees, and everyone. We touch lives all over the country, and we work against a mission of high quality, accessibility, and affordability. We're also a great democracy where everybody has a voice. Everybody gets to speak up. Everybody gets to speak out. And at the end of the day, we have to make decisions for the good of the whole. It's a privilege to work for an organization like that. And I thank you for everyone being here on this evening. And I want to acknowledge you for your willingness to sign up to making things even better for everyone walking on this earth. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Tyson. Now, we'll turn the, mo the program over to our moderator and panel. I'm very pleased to introduce our moderator, Raj Mathai, news anchor of NBC Bay Area. Raj is an 11-time Emmy Award winner who also hosts the series, The Interview. Please welcome Raj and our panelists to the stage. Uh, I come here tonight not just as a moderator, not just as a anchorman from NBC, but really, like all of you, just a community member here and wondering what's happening with our community. It's not just in one neighborhood, it's in all of our neighborhoods, and therefore it's all of our problems and something that we can tackle. So I'm very curious to, to hear from uh, this esteemed panel um, uh, of, of men and women here. Let's introduce our panelists now. Sacramento Mayor Daryl Steinberg is the co-chair of California's new commission, on homelessness and supportive housing. He previously served as president of the state senate and a state legislator, championed economic development, ec education reform, and major investments in healthcare and education. Los Angeles Supervisor Mark Ridley Thomas. <laughs> Los Angeles Supervisor Mark Ridley Thomas is a co-chair also with Mayor Steinberg of California's Commission on Homelessness and Supportive Housing. As supervisor for the past 11 years, he has worked to address the economic inequities and lack of affordable housing that are contributing to rising rates of homelessness. So really, we have both parts of our states represented. <laughs> Dr. Josh Green is not only a doctor, but he's the Lieutenant Governor of the great state of Hawaii. He began as a family physician and ER doctor in rural hospitals. He has utilized his background as a physician to combat the complex issues that are facing us now, such as addiction and mental illness, which largely affect Hawaii's homeless population. Yes, Hawaii has that issue as well. He spends almost 75% of his time focused on finding large and small ways to get homeless people off the street. So you can see the priority uh, in the state of Hawaii. Jamie Almanza is the Executive Director of Bay Area Community Services. It's a mid-sized nonprofit behavioral health and social services agency serving adults and other, and other adults, older adults, throughout Alameda County. 
She provides strategy, leadership, and fiscal oversight to programs and services. And Dr. Margot Cashel. <laughs> Dr. Cashel is director of the UCSF Center for Vulnerable Populations and the UCSF Benioff Homelessness and Housing Initiative. Her research focuses on reducing the burden of homelessness on health through examining efforts to prevent and end homelessness. Ladies and gentlemen, please, a round of applause for our... Well, we could be here for weeks on end talking about this, but I think for all of us, we just want to get some direction from the legislative perspective to the ground perspective to the medical perspective. And uh, I'll start with with Mayor Steinberg here. Uh, if you can, I'll just go down the order. In, in, in a minute or less, just, just if you can tell us uh, one of the big things you're working on currently to combat homelessness. And I know, again, you could go on for an hour on this, but if you can just succinctly in, tell us what you're working on. In 20 minutes or less? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, first of all, for having me, Raj. It's wonderful to be with this uh, honored panel. Thank you to Kaiser Permanente for sponsoring. Bernard, it's good to be with you and your team. <clears throat> so I um, have spent my adult life, political life, fighting for better mental health services in California. Proposition 63, generating 2.4 billion a year, and am a believer in my heart and in my head in the housing first model. Permanent supportive housing, intensive case management, mental health and substance abuse services as the outcome we all want and need. And of course, a robust prevention and early intervention strategy to prevent people from becoming homeless in the first place. There are a lot of people who are fragile and housed, and they're becoming fragile and homeless at an alarming, at an alarming rate. <clears throat> my thinking has evolved on these sets of issues. I haven't changed my values. I stipulate that the answer is a long-term answer. But in my view, Unless and until, I'm sorry. Unless and until we change the public policy in California that says that it is okay for people to live outdoors from both a right and an obligation perspective, we are not going to solve this problem and frankly, we're not going to even improve the problem in any dramatic way. This is a volume, it's a human issue and it's a volume issue. And we have a tacit public policy in this state that says it's okay to live outdoors. We need a right to a roof over one's head, whether it's shelter or longer term housing. And we need an obligation for people once we have that capacity to come inside. Nobody lives outdoors. It starts with a right and an obligation. And then the funding, the urgency, the policy, all the questions the rightful questions that need to be asked and answered will follow, but begins with that commitment, in my opinion. Supervisor Ridley Thomas, <laughs> your perspective, whether it's the Los Angeles perspective or the national perspective, what are you working on right now to get to, get to end this? Well, I'm working as effectively as is possible to cause it to be appreciated that the dignity and worth of every single human being must be restored. And it can't happen while they are sleeping on the cold, wet, hard concrete. In other words, uh, Los Angeles County uh, distinguishes itself as the epicenter of homelessness in the state of California. And ladies and gentlemen, I believe that I can offer you 58,000 reasons every single night as to why we cannot abide this one day longer. It is my view that we have to have short-term and long-term strategies and solutions. Uh, the mayor and I are working hand in hand at the governor's request uh, to do all that we can to not only elevate the discussion, but to work from a regional perspective to deal with homelessness, which I think is the defining moral issue of our time. It feels to me that we have to be unapologetic about our stance 
we have to recognize that the issue is in fact worsening before our very eyes. And to the extent that we recognize that there's an uptick <clears throat> in homelessness from one end of this state to the next, then we must act. I believe we must declare a state of emergency in the state of California to deal with the crisis that we call homelessness. Nothing short of that will communicate the urgency that we have. The healthcare lens is fundamentally important to getting that right, and that is essentially what I'm spending a significant amount of my time working on right now. Lieutenant Governor Green, that leads us to you. Hawaii did declare a state of emergency, correct me if I'm wrong, in 2015. What prompted it and what's happened in these last four years? Great, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, so we declared a state of emergency because in Hawaii, we have the highest per capita homeless rates in the nation. And that is an amazing thing to say because you guys view Hawaii as paradise, and we do too, my wife and I are here, but the highest per capita homeless rate, which includes many individuals who are children, many veterans, of course, people who are suffering mental illness and addiction. So because of that, it rose to the level of emergency declaration. My perspective, uh, I'll speak mostly as a physician, less as a lieutenant governor, we have an ecosystem of crisis in our country and in my state, and I believe in, in all states across the country. And when I say ecosystem of crisis, I mean whether you're connecting the dot between mental illness and then homelessness, or poverty to homelessness, and then homelessness with PTSD to addiction. This ecosystem that exists means that it's very, very difficult to get people into a well space. And so we declared a state of emergency so we can accelerate programs. I view housing as healthcare, just so you know. And I'm gonna unpack that a little bit and we'll spend more time tonight. If you look at what happens to a person who's on the street, the average lifespan is 53 years. So that means uh, people, the median of a homeless individual will die at age 53. That's two and a half decades shorter than the average lifespan of the rest of the country. That is as bad a disease as anything else we can treat. Ovarian cancer, lung cancer coming at a later age, heart disease. It is a healthcare crisis. And by looking at the underpinnings of the health concerns, we can get at much of the solution. Of course, we have to deal with economics. We have to have living wage or some such solution. We have to have affordable housing. But I'll unpack some of those other numbers if we have an opportunity tonight about how it is this human crisis and then it is a health economics crisis because the average person who is homeless in our state and across the country spends about $80,000 per person per year. And that's not getting them off the streets, not getting them better. So we have the moral crisis as was very well and eloquently described, and we have the health economics crisis, which by changing that, putting a roof over someone's head, lowering their costs by 43% in, in Hawaii, 51% in Seattle, it makes lots of other solutions possible. Uh, and by using the emergency proclamation, which I do agree wholeheartedly that should be used in California and Washington State. And I will ask the other uh, political leaders here about that in a few yes. minutes, but yes. go ahead. But that is, I think, one of the many approaches. Uh, but I'll just say healthcare, housing, they're intimately linked, and I literally view homelessness as a medical condition. Mm -hmm. Lieutenant Governor, thank you, and Dr. Green, thank you. What's fascinating about this panel is we can talk about the policy, the numbers, the trends, all those numbers here, but <clears throat> we actually have people on the ground level dealing uh, with, with the homeless community here. And that leads us to uh, Jamie Almanza, East Bay, Bay Area Community Services, the uh, executive director. Is it a financial problem? Is it a housing problem? Is it a racial problem? What is it? You're here every day dealing with it from your perspective. What is this problem? Because we don't know what the problem is. How do we solve it? Thank you. Yeah, I think that to unpack that question, I agree so much already with what was said with the panelists. I think obviously it's a, it's a racial problem. It's a poverty problem. I think as a service organization whose main job it is now to really solve the housing crisis in Oakland and in our broader uh, Bay Area. I think what we're running into every day is, is the complexity, the complexity of the individual in front of us, 
Um, I would like to discount the, the notion that um, people want to stay homeless. You know, I think as people drive by the growing encampments, there's always this wondering or question of, you know, if someone chooses to be outside instead of inside. I think when you talk to that individual, what they are choosing is, I, if, I, if, I, if I'm on a very fixed income, whether it's general assistance at $336 a month or social security disability at maybe $900 a month, they are choosing perhaps a very uh, precarious living situation. Maybe that can afford them a bunk bed in a not so desirable area where they're spending most of their income, or they're saying, well, I can at least keep that money in my pocket and live outside. And so I think as we really unpack the, the why and the how, I think as an organization who where we're really struggling and grappling with is we know how to solve homelessness. You know, every day we're housing people. Our colleague agencies across the nation are housing people. Um, I don't subscribe to the notion that there, we, we, there's not enough housing. You know, certainly we are in a crisis of not being preventative. Um, 10, 20 years ago, but we're here now. And our model, and I think what you saw from the lovely video and the work we're doing in partnership with Kaiser Permanente, is give us resources, give us the ability to be very nimble, to just really break down the bureaucracy um, as it is, and talk to people and offer them housing and talk to landlords and, and really develop kind of this uh, model that is really three components. It's uh, housing, it's resources to house people, it's the person we're wrapping around, and then it's the support of services, like you've already heard on this panel. Um, that's the work we're doing. I think the other thing I'll share, and just with the recent statistics and our point in time numbers, we used to say a year ago, for every one person that becomes housed, two people fall into homelessness. Now with the new data, it's for every one person housed, three people fall into homelessness. And so, again, we're really looking at as we're focused and really responding to the crisis of housing every person that is on the streets, we also are looking at how do we prevent those three new people from falling into, the, into homelessness. And so also through partnerships with Kaiser and San Francisco Foundation and others, we launched a model with two other agencies called Keep Oakland Housed, which is really about, uh, again, finding that person who otherwise would be moving out in the middle of the night silently into homelessness homelessness and saying, again, with resources and services that are very much laser focused, um, we can salvage that, that lease or that, that person's home. So I think those are the two most notable things I think Bax or Bay Area Community Services is working on right now. Quickly, a letter grade right now of how we are all doing as a government, as a community, as a society with this issue of homelessness. I would say A for effort. Um, <laughs> um, well, that's, that's actually mildly surprising to me because it doesn't seem some, some of the stuff that comes through the news cycle, the news media, that the effort is there. We'll, we'll talk about that NIMBY debate later, but, but proceed. I think every colleague, every, per, every person that is uh, maybe even indirect, indirectly um, touching homelessness, I think there's an opportunity now because everybody wants it solved for whatever reasons are, are for that person. Um, so I do think the effort is, uh, is there. I, I say to some colleagues, five years ago, I would try to raise money for homelessness and I couldn't get a phone call. And now, um, for the first time, it's phenomenal. I have corporations, foundations, private partnerships um, saying, hey, we want to help um, government leaders, politicians, you know, we want to help, tell us how to help. That's encouraging to hear. It really is. It really yeah. is. Okay. Dr. Cashel is here from UCSF. You do a lot of research. <laughs> tell us just a, a couple of bullet points for, for all of us here. What stands out to you? Maybe that's surprising in yeah. a positive way and what's disheartening. Yeah, I think um, because healthcare has become so involved in this issue, people really conflate the issue with mental health and substance use, and they think that that's the cause of homelessness. The cause of homelessness is a lack of affordable housing. That's why we have homelessness. It's almost so easy that it escapes us. 
lack of affordable housing, in income inequality, structural racism. That's why we have housing. It turns out people with mental health and substance use disabilities can and deserve to live housed, and most do. Um, it's a risk factor. It, it increases your risk of becoming homeless, but it, it is not one and the same. Um, it just maybe uh, an interesting statistic. I've become very interested in this idea that homeless population is aging right now. Um, when we did research in 1990, 11% of San Franciscans who were homeless were 50 or older. 2003, 37% were, and this is single adults. These are not homeless families or homeless youth. Um, right now, it's about 50% mm. are 50 and older. This is a hugely problematic issue yep. because it turns out that homeless people who are 50 and older have the health status of people in their 70s and 80s. They have trouble with memory, with walking, with all of the problems that we think of as in our older adult population. Um, but one thing that we found was amongst our study participants, who were all 50 and older and homeless, 44% had never once been homeless in their life before the age of 50. Now, if you think about what we need to solve this problem, what you need to solve the problem for someone whose homelessness is is really very much related to having significant mental health or substance use disabilities, that person probably needs housing with health services to support them. In some ways, those health services are their disability accommodations, just like a wheelchair ramp is a disability accommodation for a physical disability. But for the folks who are the working poor, who um, really lost their housing after the age of 50, and this, this happens actually through the life course, but for those folks, and that is the reason why homeless numbers are increasing despite all of our incredible efforts on mental health and substance use, for those folks, what they need is housing that they can afford. Right now in California, there are 22 housing units available and affordable for every 100 extremely low-income household. Those are households who make 30% or less of the area median income. Nationally, there are 35 units. California, we're doing even worse than that. And until we solve that underlying problem, it's going to be hard to solve the rest of it. Dr. Gashel, do we, do we have <clears throat> the right to shelter? And, and Mayor Steinberg brought it up here. Um, New York's been doing it since the 1980s. Uh, you can hear some people say it's working great. Some people say it's not working great. Uh, I know that New York spends about $2 billion a year, New York City, uh, in their shelters, hotels, landlords. Can that work here from your perspective? And, and how do you see that working here in San Francisco, in Oakland, in the Bay Area? I mean, I think it's something that has to be addressed pretty thoughtfully. Clearly, we need more shelter. There is no question, right? We have so many people who are outdoors. I think it, the question is how we do it in a way that doesn't impede the end result, is what we really need is housing. And the problem with New York, I spend a lot of time with people working in the system in New York, they spend an estimated $30,000 for each person per year to keep them in shelter. That's not what we want to do. We don't want to get there, where people have been in shelters for many, many years. Because if you create the shelter and you don't create the housing, then people are just in shelter forever. Shelter can be an incredibly useful pathway to housing, as long as you're creating the housing on the other end. So, you know, if a right to shelter includes an housing being built that they can go from there, um, that's fantastic. I think the question is how it's handled and sure, how right. we're making sure that shelter is not an endpoint but it's a way to an, a solution. Well, and, and the two gentlemen uh, leading the charge on this in California are <laughs> seated right here. <laughs> so we do have an easy segue here. Mayor Steinberg, take yeah. it away. Uh, but, yeah. but, but let me just say, what makes us different than New York City and other places that have tried this? So this it, it sounds great on paper. And it's, from, a and from the government. it's a complex issue, uh, but the nuance here is important. And I want to be clear, I am not calling, and, <coughs> and I don't think Supervisor Ridley Thomas is calling, for us to adopt New York City's right to shelter because it That's was right. flawed. Mm -hmm. It brought people indoors, but the criticism was that they did not connect the services, the case management, and there were indefinite stays. I'm not for that. But we, we, can, we criticize it and point out the flaws, but we don't acknowledge, and I'm not saying the doctor didn't, because she did, but we don't acknowledge the other piece of it. And I, let me do a digress just for a second, because there's two ways to go about solving a problem, major problem. One is inductive. Follow me for just a moment here. Where you try to piece together all of the, all of the mini solutions 
that will hopefully get you to scale so that you're getting everybody off the streets in this instance and people feel the difference. That's what we are doing here in California. It's very inductive. We are, uh, we, we, um, are doing a lot of things, but it's not getting better in terms of the social condition. There's another way to solve a problem, and that is deductive. And that is to state the end goal as a matter of obligation, as a matter of right, that people have to be under a roof. And then if, you, if that's the, the way it has to be, then the resources, the strategies, the questions get answered. But we're not even answering the questions now because we haven't committed to the principle. I don't want to do New York, but I want us to have a right and an obligation for people to have a roof under their head because when you start there, then you can actually Get to provide the intensive help that people need to reclaim their lives. And so it's complicated to explain. And I, I, I'm learning as I go here to, that this is nuanced, not New York, but still a legal right and a legal obligation, by the way, consistent with the state of emergency because Mark and I talk about it a little bit differently, but that's okay, we're partners here. Within the state of emergency, first and foremost, get people indoors so you can serve them. Without the right, without the obligation, without the public policy, the drive to get the scale does not follow. Supervisor Ridley, Thomas, let, let's jump in there because this is a big one. Uh, obviously, you guys are in accordance of this, of the right to shelter, but how do you sell this? How do you, how's the public debate on this with all that money involved to do this in California? I want to talk about money later, We're, we're too. the size of a, of a country here. Well, I think it's quite striking that we talk about this as if, as if it's a novel concept. Mm -hmm. May I just simply invoke the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, that existed um, uh, back in the time when Franklin Delano Roosevelt began to push this issue and then Eleanor Roosevelt moved in an international context to make the point that the right to housing is enveloped in the elevation of the standard of living for every single human being. It is essentially a human right. And I uh, share the view that's articulated by uh, the mayor that we need to simply ensconce in our public policy the very fundamental notion of a right that is non-negotiable. If we move from that vantage point, <clears throat> <laughs> I thought you needed a little help on the <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, if we move from that vantage point, call that a platform, then we can begin to have an intelligent discussion. Public discourse will then inform our actions. This is why uh, Bernard Tyson is intrigued with his obligation, his moral duty to engage from a perspective of civic and corporate responsibility. This is what others can do, but the burden is not in part or exclusively on the private sector. This is a public sector responsibility. It is the role of government. We are the infrastructure. The private sector is then the innovation. I simply want to say it in these terms. We can and should be very, very clear about the path forward. The short-term solutions have to involve some level of homelessness, but let's not truncate the discussion and certainly don't confuse it with warehousing. Reject the notion of criminalization of the poor. Our concept is far more robust it is about permanent supportive housing. It is about recuperative care. It is about rent stabilization. It is about a menu of options that constitute the right to housing. And if we get that in our public policy 
apparatus, I can tell you the numbers to which we refer in terms of the increase in homelessness, we will begin to check and reverse. Otherwise, we will be doomed and at the same time damned by the circumstances that will envelop us. <clears throat> well, let me say, and your input is valuable considering your role in the state for both of you. Uh, there is morality yes. and there is reality. Right. So let me just play reality. In my role at NBC and all the local newscasts last night, among the top stories for every network was two blocks away from here, a woman returning to her apartment complex, and on video, a homeless man attacked her as she was trying to get into her lobby. And right away, that has become, in these last 24 hours, the not in my backyard, look, do not build that navigation center right, out the right, right across the street here, because look what's going to happen. Reality, morality. I get it. That's a one-off. But that's, that's, the, that's what we're facing here. L Lieutenant Governor, jump yeah. in. So tons of important points here. Um, that's the reality for everyone everywhere across the country. Yeah, that's not just here in the Bay Area. Right. That's just not California. And that's, I mean, that's everywhere. whether it's a homeless individual who attacks an individual or a another criminal that attacks someone. I mean, we have crisis after crisis. It's just the human condition. We never forgive it. It's heartbreaking when these things happen. But I'll say this. In this debate the last couple of years that I've been a part of it, the most interesting moment I had, I was, on, um, I was on Fox News getting pounded pretty hard, and I talked about how, look, from my perspective, I got a left-wing mom, right, left-winger. She sees housing as a human right. And then I've got some pretty right-wing uncles, okay? And they see this as a huge economic problem. But when I expressed, like we're all expressing, that as an investment in the human condition, mm -hmm. when you get someone housed, permanent supportive housing, and you do housing first right, when you do the services right, and you bring down the costs, we actually had Rush Limbaugh calling in saying, good, return on investment, good policy to do. Rush Limbaugh. He was for it? For supporting, supporting solutions that will bring down costs with good return on investment, uh -oh. because it's a human, <laughs> yes, exactly, <laughs> because. But you bring up ROI, but, but, and people right. start to listen in and, certain demographics. And the, and the kicker is, the head of the ACLU from my region called in and was like, yes, it's a human right. But it, the solution was the same. Put permanent supportive housing in place, bring down health consequences, bring down health care costs, bring down these tragic moments that people are desperate and commit crimes, violent or otherwise. So this is actually one of those situations where we've got 560,000 individuals every night homeless. Too many are kids. So many are Californians. So, so many are Hawaiians by percentage that we can actually unite, God forbid, on an issue because whether it's my right-wing relatives that prefer me to talk about return on investment and get a good public policy solution in place to do it that way, or my more liberal friends who say, well, no matter what, it's a human right, I will do anything to shelter someone. Either argument is fine by me because it's a way that we can all agree we can go in and get corporate support, we can get public policy support, we can get housing support. We don't have to leave anyone out of the solution. It's actually a good health economics policy and a good human policy at the same time, and that's where we have to get. I got Dr. Green, you should go into politics. Oh. <laughs> I, 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 can I briefly, I have a third argument very briefly, which is that the homeless people are in your backyards already. Yes. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. The problem is spreading everywhere. So you either accept the growing status quo, mm. or we do something that is bold, that is real, about alleviating everyone's suffering. Exactly right. Jamie, what, your conversations with homeless people, what do they say about this? Yeah, I have a couple of comments, because I think as we're considering the question of should there be one bed that is available for each person that is homeless, and the, the answer is yes, if each, if each homeless person there, there should be access to housing and to services for those wow. individuals. I think where I am kind of 
uh, have been very thoughtful recently is in the last five years, we've been building a system of care. So when you think of Mental Health Services Act days, you know, you think of the mental health system or the physical health system, there's a very well-built system. There's an emergency room, there's an inpatient hospital bed, there's outpatient clinics. We are building a system of care for housing insecure people right now as we speak in 2019. So I think it's not necessarily about whether there should be a bed per person homeless, I think the devil's in the details is what Margo and I were talking about. It's what, and it goes back to the mayor too, around what is the true impact we're looking for. We're looking for housing. We're not looking for shelter. So I would encourage us as we're designing the policy, the end goal has to be one house per person. And I also want to just say it's not always permanent supportive housing. I think I've certainly experienced in my work where systems end up thinking it's either everybody Everybody needs yeah. permanent supportive housing, which is a lifetime subsidy for the rest of their lives, which is very expensive, or nothing. And so I think the art and the science and the ROI and every, everything we're yeah. thinking about, it ha the in-between in that model is who doesn't get served. So yeah. when you look at the work we're doing with Kaiser Permanente around the senior project, all of those 515 seniors would be waiting for a very long time for that permanent supportive housing unit, the, the magic of what we're doing now is we're saying that person still qualifies and when that unit comes up, great, but they're not going to die on the streets from now until then. And so is that a shelter bed for some? Absolutely. Yes, that's, that's... Is it... Um, is it a program where we're um, in the housing first you know, model? Is it a program? Many people can go from street homelessness, homelessness to housing without the shelter bed. Yeah. So I, I try to hold yeah. the perspective of we have to build the system and the interventions yeah. just like the hospital system. Dr. Shell, jump in here. Are you, uh, is there a disconnect between, with all due respect, the politicians and then the people actually dealing with the problem on we the clapped. ground level? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I love it. I because, love, because, because, yeah, I, want, because I want to hit on it. Because I both think of we're you all say, trying to accomplish the same goals. I don't think there's any disconnect sure. there. I think it's just a question of how, how you get there. And the understanding, as Jamie points out, that a lot of people just need housing. We, we found in our research, for instance, that a lot of our, one of the most common exits from housing is moving back in with family. Um, but the family face so many barriers, right? They, they're not allowed to have someone else live with them who's not on the lease. It's the extra expense, et cetera. I think we need to keep all options on the table and not be dogmatic about it. Right. Um, I think we need to keep all options on the table and get people however we can. Some people clearly need permanent supportive housing. Everyone kind of needs housing first, right? Everyone needs their housing first. Some people need a full array of services. Some people need a subsidized apartment. Some people need a shallow subsidy. Some people need um, perhaps flexible funds to allow the family to help the family bring the person back into the home. There's just a whole lot of solutions. I think that when you're in the general public and you see people on the street, everyone kind of looks the same and it's hard to, you know, and those folks have very different stories, very different pathways and probably need an array of different solutions. Uh, we have, uh, hang tight, we have some great questions from, from, from the audience. I want to jump in one from the, from the viewer, from one of our uh, audience members, so directly to Mayor Steinberg. It sounds like your, quote, obligation to accept shelter would conflict with people's civil rights by forcing them inside. How is this legal? How do you, what do you think about balancing funding for shelter with funding for housing? Mm -hmm. so these are the key, these, these you're going to get a lot of these the, questions. These are the key questions. So let, let's take uh, question number one. Um, first of all, I believe that the vast majority of people who are offered to come inside if we develop the capacity, we'll come inside. Yep. It's called assertive outreach, it's called compassion, it's called forming relationship, it's what the underpinnings of the Mental Health Services Act and all the work that we do. There are some people who will not come in under any circumstance. And I know the obligation portion of my op-ed uh, has caused some consternation. More important is the right. But I believe that if, in the end of the day, after all efforts have been made, if an individual is offered decent housing 
and or shelter, and they abjectly refuse after a long period of time, that it is appropriate for society to say you have to live indoors because the public health and public safety consequences to themselves and to the society are so profound that we cannot have people living outdoors. But by the way, the obligation is far down the line because we don't have the right and we don't have the capacity yet. And that's going to take a long time. Second question, real quick, and then I'll be quiet. <laughs> the Jamie boy, said it so well uh, there at the end. It's why, why I applauded that if I heard it right, that there are people on your program's waiting list for longer term housing. And the minute a housing unit becomes open, they ought to get that quality housing, and that's the way it works. But here's the disconnect we don't talk about. It is four to five to seven hundred thousand dollars of public subsidy to build a single affordable housing unit in California. That includes Sacramento, by the way, hmm. which is not as high cost, obviously, as the Bay Area. It's estimated that it will take till 2035 or 2040 to build enough permanent housing. The only question I'm asking, and the supervisor really is asking when you boil it down is, what do we do in the meantime? Mm -hmm. We gotta bring people indoors as we aggressively try to get people into permanent and longer term housing. Go ahead, supervisor. Discussion to date has been bereft of short term solutions. And I'm an advocate, as you made clear in your introductory remarks, of affordable housing, uh, have built a lot of it over the arc of my career as a public <laughs> official. Uh, in the district I represent now, we build uh, 53 new units every single month. But that's hardly what's needed against the backdrop of just in LA County of 516,000 units short of affordable housing. And so the question is, we cannot be one-dimensional about this. This is a multi-dimensional conversation. It doesn't need to be overly complicated. We need to have multiple solutions. People dying on the streets of California is just simply unacceptable owing to the fact that they are gravely mentally ill. We can and should intervene. Now, uh, Mayor uh, Steinberg has uh, uh, authored a piece that's sufficiently provocative until I need to rescue him again. Uh, <clears throat> this, is, this is the point that I wish to make. Uh, if we needn't be significantly concerned about obligation, May I invite you to focus just on that word, invitation. Do not make the assumption that people want to be homeless. One of the pre previous speakers made that clear. We make this housing available. Some of it will be permanent supportive housing. It will be other modalities as well. I'm simply saying to you, let's put the emphasis not on obligation, small O there, but on invitation, capital I. If in fact we I do that, thank you so much. Um, <laughs> if you accept with that degree of graciousness, <laughs> I simply rest my case. <laughs> Hold on, one more question uh, from our audience. And since Supervisor Ridley Thomas, you have the largest amount in terms of overall heads homeless down in LA. Uh, this would be more appropriate for you. What groups are disproportionately, disappro can I say it? Disproportionately. disproportionately. Yeah. And I talk for a living. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're doing well, well, don't worry. <laughs> and well. Disproportionately represented among the population uh, of people experiencing homelessness. So what groups, uh, and that, now we will jump into race because that's part of it. Yeah. Well, it's hard not to. Uh, confront our realities in this regard. I take note of the fact of uh, Commissioner Jacqueline Wagner here, who chaired uh, the ad hoc committee for 
the Los Angeles Homeless, Homeless Services Authority. Uh, proud that she's appointed by a fellow by the name of Ridley Thomas to be there. <laughs> and they issued a groundbreaking piece of work on the African American experience in homelessness and noted uh, that it was disproportionate. Uh, this is not simply anecdotal, this is empirically based. Um, in the county of Los Angeles, 9% of the uh, residents there happen to be African American, uh, but when you index homelessness, 40% of the homeless population in Los Angeles County are black people. Now, what's interesting is that that's not unique to Los Angeles. These numbers hold up pretty consistently uh, across the state and beyond. And so the racial component here is unmistakable and it is undeniable. The question is obviously then posed, well, why? Is that the case that more black people are caught in the web of homelessness? And the data uh, that was uncovered through extensive research and findings is as follows. It reduces itself to the very phenomenon of racism itself. And it goes to the issue of discrimination in the housing market. It goes to the issue of discrimination in terms of the workplace. And it's the multidimensional impacts of discrimination that form the basis of racism that essentially result in the circumstances that we have to address as it is. My grandmother said, Mark, just call it by its name. It's racism. So, Roger, Lieutenant Governor Green, I'll let you jump in. We, got, we have some similar situations in, in Hawaii. So uh, our Hawaiian population, for instance, though makes up a small percentage of our people, uh, 15 to 20 percent, the rate of homelessness has us at 40 percent of our homeless are Hawaiian, are people of color. Uh, so I absolutely echo those sentiments. It's racism, it's economic capacity and fairness in the market. In other words, mm -hmm. racism in the economic uh, right. sense. And so we have to solve this as a country. I mean, so it, not tonight and not in 2020 or whatever, but I mean, this has to be changed so that everyone has, whether it's living wage or a right to affordable housing, carte blanche. I mean, so until we get through that, we're gonna continue to have these challenges. Now, what I say, say though often to friends is that at, attack the parts of the problem where we can bring the most capacity to us to solve this problem. So for instance, in our state, because of the economics of the, you know, people's chronic illness, people being on the street, we are um, a super uh, Medicaid expansion state in Hawaii. Okay, so exactly one out of four of our individuals, 25%, which is 362,000 citizens, are on Medicaid. In our state, a very small sliver, 3.6% of our Medicaid population, which completely overlaps with our homeless population, mm -hmm is consuming 61% of our Medicaid dollars because they're on the street, call an ambulance, 1,250 bucks. They've been traumatized, they go to the ER, see me, $1,600. Another $2,000 overnight. The median spend is $4,450 for an encounter when you're desperate, you're homeless, you have these challenges. It's that small sliver of people. We have to deal with all individuals. We have to provide housing first, we have to provide wraparound services, we have to provide shelters. We know that some people are gonna be at different places on the spectrum. But by attacking that group of individuals who are suffering the most, we bring resources into other opportunities. And I did want to also address the obligation question. Mm -hmm. I, I really do kind of agree with the mayor about this. One of the challenges, of course, though, is that people with schizophrenia or severe bipolar disease mm -hmm have reached a place in their um, inner psyche where they can't any longer, by the true definition of their disease, make certain rational decisions. And they themselves become super utilizers of the healthcare system. They are part of, and this speaks to obligation, they are part of one organism, which is all of us. 
we have only so many doctors and nurses to provide care. We have only so many social workers and outreach workers, and we have only so much overall capacity until we make it a universal that everyone's getting health care services and housing. So that's where I believe we do have um, the capacity to say there's an obligation. Even if someone says we're denying civil rights to let someone live outside, I would counter, yes, there are some people that will make a decision to live outside. But many people who are suffering have already passively lost their civil rights because they're suffering with terrible schizophrenia, chronic delusions, can't get to the care, the care that they want, can't get to the care their parents want for them or anyone. So this dynamic, it's important that we as probably more liberal individuals in this you know, discussion realize that we do have an obligation to people who can no longer make decisions for themselves. And we have an obligation to everybody to have enough resources to come up with the good ideas that each of these great people will have. And that's why attacking certain parts of the problem will make more sense up front as we become a little more civilized and give people the capacity economically to get there. You talk about up front, and Jamie, I'd like to bring you in on this. We can, these are some real heavy topics about race and socioeconomics, but yeah. some, the more upfront issues are a navigation center mm -hmm. that's being proposed right now, tonight in Fremont. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of opposition. The one here in the Embarcadero, a lot of opposition. All over the Bay Area, we're seeing this mountain view. Where do we stand on this? At, at what point <laughs> do we turn the corner and have these communities say, okay, it is all of our responsibility, not in just one part of town, but yes, the nice part of town, the bad part of town, whatever. Where do you stand on this? I'm going to the city of Fremont after this oh. event uh, <laughs> uh, because they're having actually a big event tonight, um, as you mentioned. And How do you pitch people to say why this is necessary? <laughs> Well, it hasn't gone, gone so well in Fremont. <laughs> I've done it three times. Um, you know, it's been fascinating because I think, you know, and I was reflecting on this earlier, in 2019, the last thing you would think of as we're getting all of this, uh, we want to help the homeless, you know, that's kind of the mantra out there, is these same communities saying, uh, you know, with shirts, I want to help the homeless, but literally not in my backyard. And you know, I think the pitch is what we heard earlier on this panel is, so as a community, it's not logical to say we don't want you to build centers, yet we don't want to see an individual outside. You can't mm -hmm. have both. Mm -hmm. um, right. And with the navigation center model, and it, this actually ties to the shelter conversation, I think the devil, again, is in the details. I think as we're considering models of care, there's different types of navigation centers. So there's mm -hmm. models of navigation centers that are purely short-term respite with no permanent exit strategy, permanent housing exit strategy. The navigation centers that uh, Bax uh, operates and what we're hoping to operate in the city of Fremont is a navigation center where people are invited to come in off the streets. They do. And there is a model embedded in the navigation center where when you leave the navigation center, the expectation is you're moving into permanent housing. And again, it goes to the system-wide thinking around, um, I think when communities see that navigation centers in their backyards aren't just going to perpetuate homelessness, i.e. they're just positioned for maybe solely short-term respite, and there's a, an exit strategy, and we all, uh, you know, as a community, design that permanent exit strategy. I have to hope that communities will say, okay, we will entrust services that have that the net result is there will be less homeless people so at this meeting tonight or any other meeting the questions that you have all have heard uh my young son or daughter walking to elementary school i don't want them walking by this for fear of their safety or my housing value is going to go down so now you're hurting my my checkbook you want to jump in well, I was just gonna. I was just reflecting to Jamie that I was. I was at one of these meetings where there was a sighting of a, a new um, a new homeless program, and this getting a lot of community opposition. And they asked me to come and speak. And a lot of people were talking about their kids. And the most striking thing happened is a woman raised her hand and she said, "I'm a middle school teacher in this community. I spend all day." with your kids. You're sitting here talking about your kids' safety, and I want you to know your kids are watching you. They are seeing this suffering, and kids pick up mm. suffering, and mm -hmm. they want to know 
what the adults are, are doing. So yes. please don't talk to me about your kids' safety. I'm the one who's with your kids all day. Mm. I'm talking about what are we saying to our kids. And it was this really incredible moment. And so I guess I would ask everyone here who must be interested in this issue, if you're here, you know, when we go to these things, the people who are opposed show up. The people who are for it don't because they just are like, well, I, you know, sometimes they do, but often they're like, well, of course I'm for it. I'm not going to show up to protest it. And I thought it was such an important meaning. Our kids are watching us. Yes. There are a lot you of. Just, you just flipped the script. That, that's th our right. kids are watching it. us, and and this is a moral outrage, and and we need to do something. I think. Thank you. Thank you Mayor, right. Mayor Steinberg, go ahead. Thank you. So let's get back for just a second. That was a beautiful answer, and, it, and everybody needs to take that in. But let's talk politics for one <laughs> moment. Um, <laughs> I'm, OK, I'm the mayor of the city, and I'm not supposed to say the following, OK? <laughs> there is this notion of local control, which I respect. And, and, and largely adhere to. <laughs> and, it's, and, it's, and it's, you know, the notion that the state of California should not be telling local governments mm -hmm. what to do. And we give a lot of discretion to local governments to approve or disapprove these kinds of projects. Well, guess what? Local control is not a biblical term here. <laughs> <laughs> it's not an absolute. Right. And when you have a state of emergency, again, to go back to why this is so important, it is appropriate for the state of California to say that some problems are so enormous that in the right and respectful way, we're going to override local control <laughs> and, allow, and, allow these, and allow navigation centers, quality navigation centers, to be placed as a matter of right. But he, there's a there's a parallel obligation from the providers as well. And, and that is that there always must be a standard of safety and quality. Sure. In other words, the communities are correct to say, we don't want something sure. that is going to be a negative force in, in our community. And if it's not run well, then they, we, we defeat our own cause. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's not what's happening throughout much of California with quality providers and quality programs and quality facilities. You should see these sprung shelters and these navigation mm -hmm. centers. They, they not only include dignity, they're clean, they're well maintained on the inside and the outside. And if you focus your outreach on the homeless people in and around the navigation centers, you also have the prospect of improving the quality of life in neighborhoods. And so it can't all be not in my backyard, and it can't be all local control. And at the same time, there need to be standards of quality for every one of these programs. Two well said. Uh, for, for everyone, I want to respect our time. We have a few more minutes left, so we'll keep our answers uh, brief. I'm going to kind of get, get to some topics that I haven't yet. Uh, just the whole idea now, and we're here in, in our own backyard, Dr. Cashel, I'll let you start with this, but we have Apple, Salesforce, Google, all these wonderful companies that have transformed our lives. Are they doing enough to help this issue? And should, should we be asking them to step in? This is, this is a capitalist society. I mean, I think one of the issues is that we've had this huge boom of people moving here, and it's actually really funny. People always talk about homeless people moving in. Actually, it's homeless folks in San Francisco are much more likely to be long-term San Franciscans than non-homeless folks yeah. in San Francisco. There's a sort of funny thing going on there. Um, and I think you know what we had is that we, we created 8, 10, 12 new jobs for every new unit of housing, and then we're kind of shocked that we have a housing shortage or a housing crisis. And so I think, um, I think it would behoove everybody for the um, folks who have brought all of these you know, wonderful high paying jobs, A, to make sure that those jobs are high paying for everyone who works there, not just the high skilled workers, um, but also that, those, um, that, that they are part of a solution um, because there, it, is, it is not an unrelated phenomenon that we have all of this yeah. exciting development and we have a yeah. shortage. Of Supervisor that. Ridley Thomas, jump in from the LA perspective. Well, uh, I will just simply say uh, the following. 
um, that we shouldn't uh, continue to cater to those who don't want to see progress made and who don't want to elevate the quality of life of individuals who are obvious, obviously suffering. I maintain we put too much emphasis on those that we call NIMBYs. Uh, the data that we appeal to makes it abundantly clear there are far more people who want to get to solutions who would celebrate uh, the building of affordable housing, permanent supportive housing, uh, bridge housing and the like than there are those who simply say no. They say no when they wake up in the morning. <laughs> so the point that I make, we need to shift our strategy and to play to our strength and get the work uh, done. And I believe that um, uh, this panel has caused me to uh, reveal more of my uh, discordance with uh, my honorable colleague. We need to build a big tent. The big tent has to be uh, built in such a way that we de-emphasize the conversation about compelling uh, people through the state of emergency. I want the state of emergency to lubricate, not compel. It seems to me that we've got to talk about this in a different way so that we can get more people in. Now, Daryl, I need you to be on good behavior tonight. <laughs> this is an opportunity for us to move the ball forward. We can do this. But the only successes that I have had in working in this area when I've tried to make it clear that everybody has a role to play and all of us do it a little differently because all of us have a different set of skills and contributions to bring to bear. Um, I believe very, very strongly that if we work in that manner, we can see results. Ultimately, this is about achieving results, not simply engaged in high-level discourse, fancy talk, but to help people who are in desperate straits, who experience the level of vulnerability that's practically unspeakable. We've got to do that, and we need an army of people to accomplish that. And in that army, as we face this war, there can be no conscientious objectors. We've got to get this work done and get it done now. We have one more minute left. Brevity is not your strong point, Mayor Steinberg, <laughs> but uh, I, and I kid because I, I care, no. but I, I just need a tangible answer here. Uh, yes. In brief, no. <laughs> <laughs> How will you and your colleagues, uh, will you and the supervisor and Governor Newsom, declare the state of emergency like Hawaii did in 2015? We're, we're working with. What are the steps? We're, we're working with the governor, and we want the governor to have a chance to be thoughtful about yeah. all of this as well. Is we, he on we, board with this? We, he is on board with us being bold and being provocative. We don't say we have the perfect solution. I certainly don't. Uh, and certainly my colleague said tonight I don't. But that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. Because you know what? There may be better answers out there. Yeah. But at the end, w there are 90,000 unsheltered homeless Californians, according to the last point in time count. We must get close to 90,000 people off the streets. Here. I won't settle for perfect. We don't need perfection, but close to it. Yeah. That's what we got to do. You got a better idea than a right and an obligation sure. or deductive or something, then come on forward. And our commission, I know the governor and the legislature will be all ears, but we're going to push and we're going to push hard. Before we close, Lieutenant Governor Green, can this happen in California? It's a, it's a whole different bag of chips here. Totally. It, it can because human investment is good for all parties. And they can get a waiver from the federal government to spend a part of their Medicaid dollars to do these excellent programs. They can do it. They did it in North Carolina. I'll tell you the specific. You take 2% of your Medicaid budget and you get to invest in the programs of choice. Mm -hmm. And that will return more money to Californians from a tax standpoint because that return on investment works and it's already been shown and proven. So I would 
agree that emergency declaration can accelerate that, yeah. but you go to the feds, they have met with me on numerous occasions and said, you guys are, we're into state rights. Okay, well, you're a state, yeah. a big one. Go for the state right, like you've described, get that money and invest it the way you need to bring down people's costs. And you guys are gonna celebrate because you'll take big bites out of this crisis. Mm. Thank you so much. Dr. Cashel, thank you for your time. Jamie Almanza, thank you for your time. Lieutenant Governor Green, thank you for your time. Supervisor Ridley Thomas and Mayor Steinberg, thank you all for adding so much to this. I love your band -aid, you. I will now turn things over. We have one more minute here. Uh, someone who is, I saw looking intently at every response, uh, Bernard Tyson of Kaiser. Right. Bernard, come on up. Let's give the panel another hand, as well as Rob. So I'll be very brief to then turn it over to Dr. Duffy for the final words. Uh, first, once again, thank you for taking the time, for having the interest, for seeing that this is, in fact, a complex issue, but we got smart people, all of us, that can do something about it. The last thing I want to say is, you know, we often think about, you know, who's going to help solve this problem, who's going to do it, who's going to do that. And I want to use one example of how we each individually can do something in our lanes. We've invited one of our uh, wonderful employees at Kaiser Permanente, who has, in fact, been working at this problem uh, in her own way and has created an organization called Highly Favored. Highly Favored, that's a, by the way, for those of you who go to church on Sunday morning, <laughs> we know what that also means. Uh, we aspire to that. She has in fact been working in Southern California and she has been impacting lives every day by putting together along with friends and volunteers and other nurses in UNAC and doing great work of putting together backpacks and then going on skid row and other areas and meeting and greeting the homeless and letting them know that you are human just like me and giving those backpacks that also has words of encouragement, a shining light and a moment to tell them that somebody loves you. She's here with us tonight and I would like to acknowledge her as just one great example of what we each can do. And I'm gonna ask her to stand. <laughs> Alexis. <laughs> Alexis Goodall, and she is fantastic. Thank you so much for being an example that we all can look up to. Thank you, Thank you again. <laughs> she also brought some of her friends and colleagues and one of our partner unions at Kaiser Permanente, the Alliance of Healthcare Unions. And I wanna thank you for your great support and for you being out here this evening as well. And now I turn it back to our great host, and uh, what a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. It's so great to be in your house tonight. <laughs> Dr. Duffy. Thank you, Bernard. And uh, I'd like to stay in the same vein for a second and tell you about one of my personal heroes working in the homelessness field, Kevin Adler of Miracle Messages here in San Francisco. Miracle Messages organizes volunteers to record video messages from homeless individuals to their friends or family members, then circulates them on social media to enable reunions, and is responsible for reuniting 235 of our homeless neighbors with their family members or friends. <laughs> Kevin, please stand up. From And this shows, again, the power of an individual to impact this thorny, difficult field 
of homelessness. There's public policy. We need the right public policies, the right research, and so on. But we need individuals who step up with their own creative ideas to help solve this problem. We hope tonight's program has provided some new ways to look at homelessness and health. Thank you, Mr. Tyson. Thanks to our panelists. Thanks to Raj Mathai. And thanks to all of you for attending. Now we ask that everyone stay seated until our speakers have left the stage. We have our large panel with us tonight. I'm Gloria Duffy. Now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club is adjourned. <laughs>